everybody. This is Elena Mozoner, and this is Mind Over Matter podcast. And today I'm going to be talking to a very special person. Her name is Judy Holiday. She is an entrepreneur. She's a mother, and she's a rising politician. Welcome, Judy. Thanks, Elena. I'm really excited to be here. Excited to be here too. Yeah. So I guess I'm going to have to, I want to let the audience know how we know each other and who you are. Mm -hmm. That takes us back a few years. Exactly. Well, more than 20 years. Yes, it is now. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, like 23 years, something like that. Actually, it's going to be close to 25 years next year, I think. Yes, it is. Time went by quickly, right? Not so much, not so quickly. No, it, it has, it has gone by very quickly. When you think of, I mean, if you start adding up all the things that you've done and that I've done, um, I mean, it's a lot of that we've done a lot, but I think our, the fact that we've been able to keep our connection all these years, yeah. as you had been a, an exchange student in our home yeah. and um, yeah, that's how it all began. Yeah. yeah. So I was an exchange student at Judy's home. And Judy has, so it was Judy Can, uh, who was mm-hmm. all, my host father, right. um, and then four kids. Um, That's correct. Stephanie, Susan, Natalia, and Steve. That's uh, that is also correct. And I think <laughs> and it's kind of crazy because Stephanie turns forty next year, and that's just a a freaky thing for me. That is even strange for me to hear that yes. because in my mind that there are still like those young kids you know and yeah. you're still 17 turning 18 to me <laughs> really <laughs> yes. that's funny and see in Italia for me it will always be a little baby girl uh yes and of course now she is a a um an attorney and she just started with PNC Bank as the fiduciary and yeah, and she's now 31. So that does seem strange because she was like, what, eight, nine, 10 when you were here somewhere in that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And yeah. I, I'm also glad that you, we, we've stayed in touch. You guys are always my family. And I'm very proud that I had you as my host mother because you are inspiring. And this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast with you because you are inspiring, you're empowering. You're a very strong woman. You you raised kids, you had a husband, you know, you've, you've done, a, done it all. You were yeah. an entrepreneur. You had, we had our, we had our, we had our band. Kids. Yeah. We I'm had sorry? our music group. We had our music group. Music group. That's an, another thing I didn't yes. mention that you're a musician, yeah. you're a singer mm-hmm. and, uh, and now you're a politician, the rising politician. You have so much going on. And every time I talk to you, there's something else going on. Last time you and I talked, you were literally sitting at a sewing machine and sewing masks. <laughs> That's right. Oh, that's been a long year ago, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And and uh probably totals ended up being around 7,500 masks that got shipped out to almost every single state. Wow. Not Hawaii, but I did do Alaska. So yeah, there was a good team of people. That is that is really amazing. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, and then here we are, right? It's things, things are finally getting a little bit better and uh, everybody's okay. So that's, that's right. Good. Right. They, they are. Susan was just here from California. So, and she just returned um, earlier this week. So um, she had to get her mindset back into, well, it's very lush here because we've had a lot of rain. And then I hear that you guys had a lot of, a, a good five hour rain one day last week so yeah. the green and you're in pennsylvania so that we're in pennsylvania. You're, you're in pennsylvania that's right i am that's correct that's right so um yeah i'm in western yeah. pennsylvania mm-hmm. and, and it's been and a very busy bridal season oh yeah that's right you, you, you're you're doing a lot of you, you're sewing and it's a bridal season and then the proms are probably right gonna well proms are well like, like already gone. proms will be in this spring mm-hmm. and yeah this is um now a lot of people have asked me um if last year had inhibited the amount of work once i reopened up on june 1st um and the funny thing is the people that canceled their weddings last year for this year or beyond other people took those dates 
So it was busy last year, but this mm -hmm. year has become um, an insane, like it's by tenfold. Um, and I'm, there's not many people that do what I do. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I am training someone. I've got mm -hmm. one apprentice and she's coming along nicely. Um, so, uh, and, and so much so, I guess, sort of an inspiration. Susan actually um, decided that she's going to buy a sewing machine. So Stephanie already does so. Mm -hmm. And she's up in the Boston area. Um, I don't think Natalia will ever. My youngest and Steve knows how to, but he's very busy. So he, I don't yeah. think Steve is going to uh, not take over the business. Prom dresses. <laughs> um, maybe the fittings. No. <laughs> Ken, yeah. Ken had always wanted to help out, as he say. Um, uh, doing the fittings and I'm like no that's okay you can go on the other <laughs> side of the house <laughs> so in fact now my office area is where your bedroom was yes so I'm yes, knocked out yes, walls yes. and yep well let's really let's nice. jump into this because there's sure. two things I wanted to talk about first is absolutely you know, who you are the, your entrepreneurship public office being a mother juggling those things and then another topic that I want to talk about um is something that is I'm really deeply interested in, you probably already know, I started a group on Facebook and yes. this is the you know feminine, masculine, women's issues and a real mm -hmm. understanding the true empowerment. And <clears throat> you are, you, like I said, you are a strong woman and you, even my mom noticed that last time she asked you, what is it about you? How, what, what is, were you born like that? Did somebody teach you? Because you are you know, one of those people that is able to juggle things and, and you, you're a warrior in, warrior in, in some ways, you know? <laughs> And I had to, I mean, I'm actually, and I say this often, I'm very fortunate that I am able to juggle. So tell us I'm the just, secret. How, how, uh, how, because a lot of women are asking those questions. How do you juggle? Um, Being a mom, four kids, it's not easy. Right. No. When I first started doing what I was doing, I kind of, you know, it's funny. You stumble into things sometimes that end up, doing a lot better than I thought they would. I mean, I, I had no plans. Ken was a coal miner. And so every three to five years, their contracts were up, which meant if they went on strike, we had no income. Mm -hmm. And um, some people had seen some things that I had worked on with, you know, kids outfits and things like that. And that was sort of the start um, when my, when all of our kids were little before you moved, you know, before you were here, when you moved in, um, we had just gone through a huge, long seven and a half month long strike in 1993. And I was friends with the woman who managed the local bridal store and said to her, you need some help. It will help to, you know, her husband was also a coal miner. So, you know, in a community such as ours, a lot of times what will happen is people are going to help each other, you mm -hmm. know, wherever you can. And so I knew how to sew, um, but I hadn't understood the, actually what the bridal industry was at the time. And we did not have computers available. Um, so you had to go and find books and research and learn as I certainly didn't want to mess anybody's wedding gown up. So mm -hmm. I studied, um, Usually when study, the kids were sleeping. Who taught you? Who, who, who taught you? Did well, you classes or? Initially, I mean, my mom taught me how to sew okay. when I was 11. Um, we used to have uh, actually terrible arguments. I was number three of six kids. And we would have terrible arguments because in the 70s, when I was in high school, um, it was just when pantsuits were becoming the fashion. And if you worked in an office, then, which I did, I worked at, I would go to school for half a day and then go work at an office, but I didn't want to look like the old ladies in the office. At the time, the ladies were maybe 28 to 40 years of age, but to me, I was 17. So I thought I was, you know, yes. something. So I would buy something and then I would change it mm. to my style, mm -hmm. to my, and, and we, my mom and I would, we would get into some pretty intense conversations mm -hmm. and arguments about it but Wait, was she um, not happy with what you were doing and then the styles that you were leave it alone it was already made leave it alone I see 
Yeah. Huh. So, so anyway, um, years later when she would come and stay out here at the house, when she, she had gotten sick with Parkinson's. So she would stay with us four months out of the year. Um, she had sold her house. She would stay with my sister, um, one of my sisters or my one brother, the other, you know, six to eight months out of the year, but she would come here basically during the summer. And at the time I had, um, well, Ken was still working, but I had my shop in town. I had taken it out of the house. Um, I was not doing so many private clients. I was still mainly doing contract work for bridal stores. And so many times, like I could, one thing I could do with doing that was I could work around my kids' schedule. Mm -hmm. So while they were in school, I would sew. Um, so they while, were all in school at the time. They were all in school. Yes, they were all in school at the time. And Natalia? Mm -hmm. Natalia actually too. She was, so in 1990s, well, I guess when I actually started in 87, she wasn't born yet. Susan yeah. wasn't born yet either. So oh, yeah, I kind of maneuvered around, like just doing it supplementally. Yeah. Um, and, and so it, you know, you just figure out what you have to do. And did you take a break when they, when Natalia and Susan were born? Well, um, I, I did not work as many hours in a week. I might have, I did it on nap time or after they went to bed at night, I would finish and work on things. At because night. I still had deadlines to, to keep, you know, deadlines, not only for them, mm -hmm. but deadlines for bridals and bridesmaids dresses. So you, you actually were working. You didn't take the, like a break you know no completely no, no and and what about did you have anybody helping you like babysitters or you know cousins sisters Ken did anybody you know look after the kids um well Ken works swing shift and swing shift means you don't get much sleep you know you work night shift midnight to seven seven to eleven and then three or seven to three and then um, three to 11. It was, it was hard for him to be able to do that. Um, when and we played music over on the weekends. So we, I did have several girls who, what possessed them to want to watch four kids when we would go out and play music from usually 10 at night till two in the morning. But I really appreciate and God love them for having done that. And I paid them well. So I yeah, mean, I paid yeah. them well. But, um, but it's not but easy. Well, it is not I easy. I have two kids now and I know it's not simple. Um, right. I do have somebody helping me during the day Good. from eight mm -hmm. to two o'clock um, so that I can get my work done. I work with mm -hmm. clients, I can do a podcast, I'm writing, uh, posting right. things. And then Marcella is also working. And then the oldest one, the three-year-old Adelina goes to school from okay. nine to one, four hours. Mm -hmm. So- yeah. And, gives, and, gives, and that's helpful. Very helpful. You know, yeah. But you are juggling. And, and I think about how you have been able to adapt your schedule. And, and I don't have any family in Western Pennsylvania. So I didn't have anybody family wise who could help me. Mm -hmm. So um, there were a number of people like friends that once the kids started school, other moms, we were able to sort of trade off time for whatever you know volunteer work or that but and and I was very grateful for that for yeah those mm -hmm. but but it's I can imagine it's even more it's harder to with four four kids you know well let's just say not everybody's on the same schedule and right. so you just have to kind of you know I mean when I look back on it now I think how did I do it but right. I think you just <laughs> figure it out as you go very uh, true it's so yes. funny because i'm uh, sorry did you, did you, were you going to say something no 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 i'm just saying is i'm i'm glad you and i knew you would you would understand and it's interesting because i actually when my oldest one my three-year-old adelina was born it was very hard in the first year extremely hard right. only because judy because i didn't know what to do and i right I was shocked from going, you know, being free, scheduling things whenever I wanted, mm -hmm. getting up in the morning, spending a little bit more time, you know, putting 
makeup or like <laughs> lotion or, or do my nails. My, I haven't got my nails done, so I do have the time. <laughs> You know, doing those things and I know yeah. going out with friends. I'm not like I, w- right. I was going out all the time, but still, you know, having you know social life and. But then I was shocked and it was like I, I can't do any of those things. And then I started learning organization and managing things, right. and, and I actually and, became more productive. More right, productive. and that's that's the key. As I have said to many people, that you know, we're really fortunate, yet we learned how to do that. We've learned how to organize our time and our, um, I mean, our kids like our quantity as much as they like our quality. They like our, our time. Yeah. That's all there is to it. But we are able to do, um, and we're fortunate to, to understand that organization is everything. And sometimes I look at the calendar and I'm like, oh my heavens how in the world and why did I schedule as much as I did? Um, hmm. And it has, it has changed over the years just based on when our grandson was born and um, going up to Boston for several weeks and helping with being a volunteer to different community events that happen. Um, but, you know, typically the saying is, if you want to get something done, ask somebody who's busy because they can figure it out. Mm-hmm. We just, we just have figured out how to juggle. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we don't think about ourselves as much. That's, that's, that's the problem. where, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's where it gets a little, a little difficult from time to time. And I hate to say that since Ken's passing, which was two years ago, uh, and the previous two years was taking care of him. I still had the business. I still had things going on, but you have to, re- you renegotiate your time based on what you can do. I mean, you come first, um, your spouse, your children come first. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they can tell you, they can tell you from me that I didn't always put them for, like if I had a deadline and if it was just a matter of, you know, sometimes I'm like, well, you have to come right in here with me while I'm working on this. Oh, yeah. And so that I, I won't say it was perfect. Trust so me, feel, it wasn't. You, you, you say that they might say that they were not coming first in a sense? Oh, from time to time. Yeah. 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 I mean, I would get mainly, mainly from Natalia, who is the youngest, yeah. that um, uh, I needed to get a real job. And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> um <laughs> I did work at the university for four years as a costume shop supervisor. And I guess I took my, um, my normal work ethic, which is you work till you get it done. You don't put it aside. You don't, I'm not a, you know, clock in at nine, clock out at five sort of person. So if something needed to be completed and with, a theater, yeah. you have to work around theater schedule time. So she um, felt like you were working too much. Yes, I was working way too much. Yeah, and so then I reeled it back and brought it back, uh, the business back to the house. And um, so once again, you know, kind of renegotiate your time again. Sometimes yeah. I have to put the brakes on. Yeah, yeah, and that's okay. Yeah. And I've realized, and 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 I think this is this is an ever evolving thing that we do Mm -hmm. what what worked a year ago is not going to work this year what works now is not going to be what you're doing in five years very true Um, yeah so and it's a matter oh it it is and that's what you're also going to find with the girls that that as their needs increase you will you will renegotiate Mm -hmm. with between you and Marcello, how to manage your time. Um, Sometimes it works great and other times it doesn't work so great. And then then we're, yeah, that's normal. And I think it's good because we, that's change and we constantly need to be flexible in a sense, flexible with things that are happening, right? Right. Um, Being able to flow with change and, and adapt to it. So how was it 
like was there any difference because you have one son and three girls um mm -hmm. what, was there a difference between raising girls and a boy is, is there a difference? <laughs> well let's see hmm. those levels of of four women going through or girls women going through um uh our hormonal balances mm -hmm. versus um a husband on swing shift and a son who is is trying to find his you know masculine way um yes. oh it's a little challenging I'll, i i will not uh i'm glad steve's not sitting here right now because i'm afraid he'd have a lot to say about this oh that's very but, interesting. <laughs> you know you, you you balance each of the personalities mm -hmm. and each of their interests based on whatever they happen to be you know i mean steve was big into sports um stephanie did the the girls the younger two were more into to theater and um spice girls yes spice mm -hmm. girls remember that? <laughs> yes i found some of their stuff as i was you know cleaning out the spare bedroom closet and yes it's very entertaining but they enjoyed that stuff. So yeah. I can't tell you how many concerts I had taken the kids to. And, um, and we would do a lot of different things. So their, their style of music, they, we were, Ken and I were very um, uh, uh, culture oriented in that we would want to um expose our kids to lots of different things yeah we didn't we were not like you only stay in this bubble we did polkas we did um you know 50s 60s 70s we did classical music we would go to um an opera we did it we've done chinese opera we've done um like all types of venue that i think then engage your children into being um more full human beings right M having more perspectives and absolutely in student is also was probably another way to mm -hmm. open up to a different culture you know, absolutely to, right? absolutely and i just think about our trips to like longwood gardens and Ooh, i know the time when we went to to philadelphia and then up to new york city and and that experience and um it, it's, you know. it was a good foundation for me personally great foundation yeah. great start um i i re remember now that i'm you know more into i've always been in women issues and it kind of flows mm -hmm. and changes as i evolve as i change as culture is changing um i remember stephanie had girls and they were doing some sort of homework on the floor and yes. I, I asked you i think what are they doing you're like oh it's this feminist feminist something about feminine feminism i'm like Right. That's interesting. I've never heard about it. I didn't inquire, but I was, I was kind of observed. And I right. that was my right. first exposure probably to the, the idea of women, women issues. Right. And yeah. And I and I think that we learned as much from you in your exposure from your perspective, being from Russia, that you know, um, I, and I've spoken to other exchange students who I've done dresses for and, and things. And I had one girl here last year from, I want to say, I had one girl from France for three weeks. I was just, someone just sent me a message. Could I please take another exchange student? I am considering it because mm. I, mean, I got a big house. I yeah. room. Um, and, um, but but it's interesting. The one person who I did a prom dress for last year, she or two years ago, she said, you know, diversity where, where she was from, I want to say Austria or Germany, they're not used to diversity. Like, and and you and I, you know, the United States is nothing but diversity. Mm -hmm. And it triggers women's issues. It triggers social issues that um. I mean, I can't imagine a, a culture in a country that doesn't have, shouldn't have social issues. I mean, mm -hmm. we all have people that have been born to, you know, you don't, you don't know what, what socioeconomic spectrum you're going to be born to. 
that doesn't mean you shouldn't have the same opportunities. And that was one of their part of their projects um, back in mm -hmm. high school. And, and oh, I okay, so that was the project at high school. You remember the project? Right. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. So that was about um, equal opportunity. Correct. Correct. In that, yeah. you know, I mean, you've grown and figured out how to develop your business, just as I have done mine. If I were in a different location than Western Pennsylvania or in a rural region of Western Pennsylvania, you know, I know that I could, you know, I charge based on basically, I mean, I don't charge anybody different based on their, what they can or can't do. I, I know how much time things take. I've developed a system, um, you know, you, you, you readjust your, your level of income based on what your needs are. Um, that's different if you're out in the workforce and two people doing the same job, but two, you know, one male, one female and not being paid equally. And that's an issue. Mm. But we've kind of gone a whole different route since the pandemic. And that also is something where people, I think, are thinking more about, do I really need to work right now? Not to say, see, I'm not in, I'm not in the, the mindset of people don't want to work because they're getting paid better. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the case. I think, though, they're rethinking their choices mm -hmm. because... Mm -hmm they've realized that either I need to educate myself to a point to be able to make a better living. Um, and just because there's a job out there, say at McDonald's or Wendy's or whatever, I shouldn't just take it because it's there. I need to better myself to, to be able to survive. That's mm -hmm. the whole thing with, you know, the fight for 15 and, and, so when anyone has ever done work for me or with me, um, as I said, I'm apprenticing someone, um, I've never just paid minimum wage. Like that just confounds me. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be reasonable. Um, you know, I give a, a trial time and a trial period. And then, um, uh, but I still make sure that that it's, it's a reasonable amount that is not, um, you know, you have to, you have to feel like, I mean, I always feel like I'm still that person who was just starting out and I wasn't appreciated by my talents. Oh, and, yes. and when you, and when you, um, now this is 40 <clears throat> years down the road, yeah. but, but like, I think you should always remember the shoes you used to step in yeah. and walk in to know that, you know, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, I, we live, Ken was a laborer. He was, yeah. he was in a union. Um, so I think union ment mentally, I think about people who have to keep fighting for things um, that, you know, they, um, some say that they don't need um, to be boosted higher because, you know, they're of whatever persuasion they, they, you know, I, there's just, just different people. I have a ge one gentleman who I have, you know, I'm in a networking group with and he has a, he's got a good thriving business, but he's upset that he can't keep his skilled workers and so my question to him was, mm -hmm. these men that work for you, so I don't care if it's men or women, but these happen to be these men who are technicians who work for you. He was upset because he had one guy that he was really hoping to move forward, but the guy needed to get a second job to make ends meet. Oh, I see. Yeah. And so my question to him was, so had you considered getting, giving him more, like increasing his pay, yeah. which increases his level of responsibility, mm -hmm. but it also increases his loyalty to you. Mm -hmm. And then he's not feeling like he needs to get another job exactly. to make ends meet, to meet the, you know, when you explain things that way. Um, it's very true. 
Very true. Yeah. yeah. I, I have, mean, we have a, sorry to interrupt. Don't go, add go that go. There's a restaurant that we really like. And mm -hmm. um, I called because I wanted to make a reservation for lunch. And I'm right. like, and they're like, no, we're not open. I'm like, oh, really? What's going on? She's like, we don't have enough workers. Correct. I'm like, oh, what, when do you think you guys open up? You're like, well, I don't know. Whenever we and have workers. Know. Correct. And I'm like, we're, I was talking to Marcel about it. I'm like, this is such a great restaurant. And he, and we're like, why don't, why don't they just give a better, you know, hourly pay or something like some Correct. sort of incentive? Because obviously it looks like people just, don't want to work, don't want to work, or they're looking for, but that's, and yet that's not really the case. The case of it is, and it's funny because, um, I had to do a dress for a girl who is an assistant manager or a local Perkins restaurant. Mm -hmm. And she would have just as soon, once the restaurant reopened, she would have just as soon gone back to takeout only because not like the people that she has working are working so hard and yet who she answers to who didn't lose any money through the pandemic they were able to apply for and receive um the ppp and the different um stimulus packages but they didn't give it they didn't pass it down to their workers who have had to take an off like i mean I, I understand, like you, Marcello, I mean, I know people that we would love to be able to go out and, and you respect their job, you respect them. But unfortunately, a lot of people are not so respectful. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and she told me some stories about some of the behavior of some clients that came in to the restaurant that were just awful. And, 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 Nobody needs to, nobody who's working should have to take that level of disrespect. Almost and, like abusive, right? In a sense. Yeah, very abusive. Very. I mean, she, she, I was, I was just mortified with some of the stories. And she said that that's why she would have just as soon pay the people, pay her cooks more, pay her people that would, you know, like balance the front so that when people would come to pick up their orders or they would come out, you know, they would call, mm -hmm. she would just as soon go back to that because um, there were, there were some just things that would happen with customers that were just inappropriate, just yeah. completely rude. Um, when, when masks were mandated, um, she had one gentleman who got angry about something and he pulled his, her mask down and spit in her face and you're like wow she just answered his question she tried to keep it really cool she said she happily led him to the door and told him that he was well no this is just her. aggressive and not it is it sick. is and and i've and i've heard this from other people as well um outside of this area i mean i've heard from you know anybody who's in the food service industry um you know, so here it's a restaurant you'd really love to go to. Do you think a woman would ever done something like that to <laughs> another, well, another human? I don't know. I, I, so here's, here's the thing that we discussed. We yeah. think everyone should be required to do at least one year of food service and maybe they would be respectful. And I mean, everybody, everybody who's ever had, you know, started, everybody should be required instead of having that entitlement. Of thinking that you should be given whatever you're told you want like you know whatever you ask for you should have immediately and if it's not as fast we've we've come to a point in society that we're not we're not respecting each other and that that saddens me although i think you know we have all different things that we come across i'm really fortunate I, I cannot say anything more than that. I am lucky that I have a, a more um, glass half full personality versus a, a depressing personality. But I'm fortunate with that. And I've been able to, to um, help a lot of people. Weddings are a very intense time. And so 
if someone is not feeling about good about something they're in, you know, what they're wearing, I can usually calm them down enough mm-hmm. to make them feel better about what, you know, you know, I have a little part of, of their day. Um, and hopefully some of the conversations that we have while they're in getting fitted, um, helps them to like, you know, have a better positive, more positive outlook on life or, yeah. you and know, you, you have, a, you have an ability for a human connection with people that come to you. you mm-hmm. know? You're, oh you're yeah. To see them, give them space. And, and that's mm-hmm. where I was doing a podcast with uh, Tessa, who's a project manager. And she says, you know, I, she was talking about it as a feminine quality. You know, she has a very strong, you know, masculine and feminine, she, feminine. Mm-hmm. She says, I was, I'm able to honor my feminine and just give space to people and ask them, how are you doing? Like when she speaks mm-hmm. with her, you know, work, people that work for her, help her, she says, just be present to them as opposed to just, you know, not seeing them, you know? Right, right. Mm-hmm. And I think I have, I mean, I see more women than men. Um, undoubtedly, although, you know, if I started a whole second line of just doing men's suits, they'd be very happy. Mm-hmm. I don't have enough hours in my day. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, and I've, I've, you know, fine tuned the number of thing or what, like you can, anybody, I can't say anybody can sew, but a lot of people sew, but that doesn't mean everybody can do what I do. You have to think inside and outside the box and, and yeah. stuff. But in terms of practice and time, you probably have oh, your, yeah. your ways to go very quickly through things, right? Like be creative. Mm, really more creative. so, yeah. More so. And then as, as um, fashion and stuff and fabrics change and textiles change, you be, have to be able to adapt to those changes. Interesting. Um, but change. it's, it, yeah. It, yeah. But with that, it's funny because there's always the interconnection to like how person is feeling internally Mm -hmm. to what they feel like when they look in a mirror there's a lot of interconnection there it's yeah yeah I had um I had someone here the other day and I had to tell them a story about a uh, something that I had um had read um uh, a forensics artist had um had put a call out to 50 people and a you know what a forensics artist is someone who um they're told a description of somebody and he's sketching or oh, she's sketching okay to see you know or like to give an idea of what someone like a missing person or something like yes, that yes yes Actually, yeah. okay so the experiment was um it was interpersonal which was so he never saw physically any of these people that he, of these 50 people. So he had basically a, a, a divider um, between him and, so he paired everybody up. So there were 25 pairs that made 50 people. And he would pair these two people up who were on the other side of the board. So he never saw either one of them. And what the, the experiment was, was you had to describe yourself and then you describe the person that you were paired with. Mm-hmm. And then their pair would do the same thing. Describe yourself and describe the person that you're partnered with. So he went through all 50 people and he had, so he had ended up with 100 sketches. Was he listening? Now, was it written down? No, he was, he was listening. listening he so would he describe, <laughs> like someone would describe themselves and he would sketch he would do his mm-hmm. artistic. So he was hearing their voices as well. Yes. yes, that's correct. And so, just like you would with a, you know, like a police forensics artist, mm-hmm. they're hearing. So, if somebody had witnessed something and they said, "Describe who you witnessed, yes, you know, who yes. did, who did you see?" and that person is trying to describe whatever they saw, they'll it's sketch it out. Spiritual and kind of like spiritual. It is now. So the experiment was this. After those 50 people left, what he did is he had this big warehouse and he hung the picture, the, the, the drawing of the person who described themselves next to the drawing of that same person described by the other person. So their partner's picture. And so now you have a hundred pictures, but two of the same person. So you don't, do you understand where mm-hmm. I'm going? Yes, I know what you're Yeah. And so did they match? 
what picture, what artistic uh, drawing was the most realistic to see. what they see. looked like? I think it's the one who's describing the other person. It's correct. Because we describe ourselves in such, like we see ourselves, oh, sad eyes, or, you know, like the dark circles, or right. the graying hair. Yeah. We see a more haggard, frazzled look. And so that's how you sketched exactly how they, that person describes themselves in their mind. That's interesting. But the more realistic view was from the one who was being, was describing the opposite person. And it's also kind of goes to show how we ourselves tend to be a little bit down on ourselves, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so when someone comes in and says to me, oh, they keep focusing on us, part of their body that they're just not happy with. And I'm like, I'll be honest with you. I don't see what you're telling me. I mean, I see how the fabric works on you, but I don't like you know, this is just you fixating on this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of in raising your kids, how to help them get out of the fixation. Sorry about that. Yeah. Like get, like find the positive, whether you're dealing with when Adelina's in her, you know, uh, you know, daycare and in school that, you know, something you know that she's describing a child's behavior or whatever and so that maybe it's and that's how I taught the kids it's you know maybe you need to you don't know maybe what happened before she came to school that day or he came to school that day or maybe you know so you know be their friend until something you know is there a reason that you shouldn't be, but, but I mean, you know, think I, having more. a positive outlook. I so, so I see right. where you're going. Yeah. Like the, like what you're doing in your work, when you mm -hmm. make dresses, yeah. you, you put a positive um, outlook on it. You know, you, you help right. the other person to see themselves better, not only with what you're saying, but also with the dresses that you're making. Right. Right. Absolutely. And this, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and, I, and it helps. So, you know, in, in the integration of, I mean, one of the things um, that, that occurred when Ken got sick and then passed away, you know, he had such a personality and he didn't look at people's politics. He didn't look at people's religion. He didn't look at people's color. That's what, if, what drew me to him in the first place. He was a very kind, loving person all around. Like he, he grew up in the 50s and the 60s when there was a lot of pretty intense stuff going on. Oh yeah. That was, you know, un unfortunately we have a, we're having a very harsh resurgence of it. But standing in line to see me during his viewing was eight to 10 straight hours. People waited in line for two and a half hours just to come and say hello to me. And these folks were every background you could think of. And it was mentioned to me, like to me, like I knew the, like, like I knew people from us playing um, music, um, just him hanging around uptown, and so oh, wait, you were a music. He met you. You were a musician. This is that's no. how you met. No, 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 no. no. Oh, okay. No, oh, I was in college. Oh, I see. Okay. No, no. Just, just through us playing all the years of music okay. Okay, and cool. all the different people we played in front of. I mean, I don't know, ten thousand over the years, mm -hmm. if not more. Um, you know, you do small parties. You're, you know, but. <clears throat> it was a group of 850 to 1200 people standing in a line that you'd never see standing in line together in right. any other circumstance, but right. they were doing it for me and they were doing it for him because as we try to raise our kids the same way is everybody has something to give. Everyone has something good. And so you, you don't treat people generally. 
you treat them individually. That's very true. It's, yeah. it's a, you're, you're very progressive in, in the way you think. And, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised that you are in politics, which I really want to talk about. We'll talk about it in a few sure. moments. And before, mm -hmm. I want to ask you about the patriarchy. And that, that we started okay. talking about feminism, patriarchy. And who Ken is, because Ken to me always been like this really warm, kind, kind man. And, and when we talk about patriarchy, did you do you see it in life did you see it in your life did you see it in can like what what is what are your opinion on patriarchy um well i guess it's good to, one thing that your folks need to know that are listening in is that ken was 13 years older than me when we met he was in his 30s i was 20 and um it just sort of clicked um and he, I don't know, he, to me, he was always a warm in person. He was, like I said a few minutes ago, he was very accepting of everybody. Um, it didn't matter, you know, their skin color, their, their, you know, religion, religion, like we, that was not, our interest was like on a personal, a much more personal level. Um, patriarchy, like I grew up in an all Italian family. And there's a whole lot of patriarchy in there. But my grandmothers on both sides were also, the, the matriarch of the family mm -hmm. was also very, um, uh, you know, was, a, was you're, there was a high honor for that position. My grandfather's the same thing. Um, my dad's dad was a, a business owner and my mom's dad was a bricklayer. Um, and outside of Philadelphia, you know, they both had my, my dad or my dad's dad was more of an extrovert, but a very kind man. Um, not, not, you know, brash or anything. He was just a very kind man, proud that he kept, had his own teeth through his whole life because, you know, back in the day, sadly, a lot of people would lose their teeth because it was poor, poor hygiene. Yeah. I, my mom's dad was a very quiet man, but um, they had, you know, they lived a, like three miles outside of Philadelphia and whatever grounds you had, you gardened, you had chickens, you had, it was an old Italian neighborhood, but, he, you know, so they would, they would put up food, they would make sure that they had enough for their family and for the neighbors if somebody was in need. Mm -hmm. um Ken's side of the family when I met Ken um his dad was already it seemed to be already sick with pancreatic cancer so I never met his grandparents only the things that he told me about them I have a lot of information about them too um but he remembered like he always had fairly strong women in his family Mm -hmm. the men were always working so like the interactions were um when there was um a family wedding or a family funeral and you know you know they were they were of uh carpatha russian slavic heritage they were big beer drinkers mm -hmm. and so like when i came in onto the family was a little different for me like I took it it was from a different like I yeah it was different for me mm -hmm. um than what I was used to Ken was always nervous about raising a son mm -hmm. I've got daughters how am I supposed to raise a boy I'm like well we roll with it you figure it out and um you know he you get out there and play ball, you throw the football, you do all the, you know, whatever Steve liked to ice hockey, play, um, you know, it's pretty rough and tumble. We would have parties with little boys out here, eight-year-old boys. Who, what do you do with he a bunch of eight-year-old boys? He wasn't used to raising a boy, huh? No. <laughs> he was like, he liked to just sit back and watch. He's, he's he actually, what, he's an what, observer. He, he has the, um, I don't know if you know that lens of feminine masculine maybe it's it's just one lens to look at things right 
yeah. um, he does have feminine qualities, I think, right? He oh, yeah. And as he got older and when he got sick, we had this weird reversal of roles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ken was the artist. His artwork, his music, he couldn't fix anything in this house. He just did. He had no. He had no desire to learn. He every time he would be moving and putting up pictures, and I'd hear a hammer being or a nail being hammered. I would just go, "Oh, what is he doing now?" Just because I'm like, "Oh, okay. What do we have to fix after this?" Because he just it just wasn't his thing. So that's where I think what we would think it would be more his more feminine side. Mm -hmm. But honestly. We're a balance of both. We Every are, human being are. are. It, and it does know. look like, sorry to interrupt, but- No, please. It, 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 to me, like I, I find it, it, it's, it, it is fluid. We are, Absolutely. we have these two, two genders within ourselves and they are fluid. So, you know, when we talk, when people talk nowadays that there's a lot of conversation about gender, no gender binary, no, you know, fluid, non-fluid. Like if you, it's hard to come from it from a conservative point of view and say, this is total nonsense. This is just like gender pronouns. Just, but then if you really think about it from a very progressive point of view, like it, it makes sense, you know, it just. Right. And, and, and if you, um, if you look back on history, we've sort of been programmed to believe that this is the male side and the other is the female side. That's just a matter of like, you know, was it really like, was, you know, on, in some parts of it, it had a lot has to do with saying being raised within the Catholic church and the hierarchy of the Catholic church mm -hmm. has a, a, a huge impact. And of course we've seen the, 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 the changes that have had to be made um, because of abuses and things like that. Um, you know, I mean, in every generation of people, you are seeing in every decade how, you know, what we read and what we see and what we hear um, is all being, um, I always think of the word propaganda. Um, conditioning, conditioning. It is conditioned. Yeah, you're conditioned based on what you are what you are um just seeing in you know media has media yeah yeah and i think that the fact is you know long long time ago it was hard for women to go out there and do things because you have to birth a child it takes nine months it's a lot of work breastfeeding you know raising a child so it's hard so men are out there doing more things so it has been such opportunity, the opportunity was set that way. I mean, right. you know, right. it, I mean, the, the mentality of the 50s. I mean, if you watched um, uh, Mad Men, um, mm -hmm. you know, that was the late 60s, early 70s. I mean, I laugh about the, that because I remember, you know, gender roles were identified by the people who told you what your roles were to be. When I you know, you had asked me one of the questions that you said you wanted to bring up was um, that when I was coming out of high school, um, you, you did one of three things as a female. You were a teacher, you were a nurse, or just so happened because it was within our family, or you were an accountant because I had an uncle who was an accountant and I was really good at business. Um, and that's, you know, how did I end up in the direction I did? Mm -hmm. I didn't go to school. I mean, I guess I went, you know, I came out here to come, I came out to Indiana, of Pennsylvania to go into special education. It was a job that I had had before I moved out here, um, working in a residential home before mainstreaming started or as mainstreaming started with um, mentally and physically handicapped kids. Mm -hmm. Now, mainstreaming had in those 40 years has changed tremendously yeah. um also the elements of autism and the spectrum and everything that you know we didn't know of kids being autistic in the 70s that was not even a term yet yeah. um yeah. and so um it it's it's 
the role of things that I decided to do could be considered very gender specific in that I'm a seamstress. I, I develop my talents. I develop my, my business based on needs, but also because it was something I really enjoyed doing. And an entrepreneur, and, you're a business owner. And you're an entrepreneur also. And I take that yeah. from my grandfather and my dad and my uncles. We owned a business. We owned a gas station. Yeah. Um, but um, the business model more came in line from high school um, high school classes that I had that I just did very well in. That was I was on the business track. Um, I had actually initially started school in accounting and computers were just coming out then. Yeah. And you would have to do data and data. I would fall asleep in front of a computer. So wasn't, I wasn't interested in that because it didn't let me think like it didn't spark any excitement. Yeah. 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 Put me to sleep. Literally. I'm like, oh, this is terrible. And not that I'm not good with numbers. It's just that it was just not, it wasn't it yet. When Ken and I met, he, like I said, he was a coal miner. Um, we started having our kids a couple of years later when we got married. And I was pregnant with Susan. How old were you when you, when you were pregnant Sorry. with Susan? I was 27 to 28. And then Natalia was born. Natalia was a year and a half later. So like in yeah. your 20s. Right. So okay. just, yeah. So also the, your energy level in your twenties is a whole lot different than as you keep progressing. You, mm -hmm. you just have to know yourself. Um, but um, so I had um, when in 1988 um, is there was going to be a strike coming. I started doing stuff for bridals in 1987, then got pregnant with Susan it's also when I started playing music with my husband. And um, at first, my brother-in-law was the bass player. And then there was a little rift between you know, the two of them, two brothers. And um, my brother-in-law quit. And then um, Ken said to me, handed me a bass and he said, I'll show you the first five. He showed me the first five frets on a bass. He said, learn how to play this. And I'm like, Huh? And so in my very and anal, you learned it and you started doing it. Yes, in my type A brain, yeah. luckily I'm a type A and a type yeah. B. I laid out a, a papers to do the entire fretboard and realized as I was doing stuff for what he showed me that there was a pattern mm, to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I went through my whole pregnancy with Susan, um, playing music, playing for the public. Uh, had her, didn't miss a beat, didn't miss a job, was very fortunate to the three girls that said that they would be willing to crazily be my babysitters. That's, um, that's amazing. So yeah. you, you, I mean, and we only have like eight, seven minutes left and yeah. have uh, an appointment yeah. soon. Qu very quickly, like you've done all those things, you've learned the, oh, playing the guitar yeah. real quickly, and now you're running for a public office. This is huge. Right. Tell me briefly about it, how the idea came about, and what's going on with it. Okay, so um, let's just say since 2015, I have been a little, uh, it's, it has bothered me. I, I'm, I'm not a Trump person. I remember him from Atlantic City days and the decimation of Atlantic City because of the, um, I don't like con people. I, I like honest people. Yeah. And sorry, that was the direction that like, he always rubbed me the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, my uncle lost a lot of money from that particular casino. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, in the millions. Yeah. So I, the, the whole thing of, of lack of transparency when when the the, uh, the more right side you know republican side would say and i know a lot of, i mean i have a lot of friends from everywhere so just uh, understand yeah. that but but when the large impact on in in media was that um 
that there, you know, there were obvious untruths, but it was being perpetuated because the more you say something, you know, knowing, knowing that it's not true, mm -hmm. people still believe it. And so my jump into it when I was, you know, the whole thing about election fraud. Oh, yeah. And I said, you know, over and over and over again, all of the information in the state of Pennsylvania, whether it's Michigan, whether it's Arizona, whether it's Georgia, that it happens from the 2020 elections and it's shown time and again, and there's still the fight of trying to re-audit things that have already been done, was my saying, and, and without, you know, Ken being here, it was one more jump into another arena, which was, you know, if not now, when? Mm -hmm. which is why I decided because people know who know me know that I I'm a truth seeker I'm not I will not pull punches I won't I won't even flower over even like I can you know I kind of do it with my with my business when I'm working a gown on a person's body I'm going to make sure that you look the best you can look if something doesn't look good on you, they know that I tell the truth. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you you look good in something if you just don't. Integrity. Um, yeah. But I, but I say yeah. it. Yeah. But I say it. And, they, and it's not a matter of just being believed. It's being trusted that I'm telling them from an, the honest perspective of what I think could do better for you. Yeah. That's what I'm wanting to bring into politics local as where i'm starting okay so local that, what is public office exactly what is this public office it's a the a white township supervisor i live in the in white township that's not in the borough of indiana but in white township and being the supervisor there's you know you're delegating where money is going where permits are set um wastewater management uh logging mm -hmm. i mean it's it's very very local government stuff but the same group of politicians, the same five have been in here, like that if you call and ask a question and wanna know why monies are going in one direction versus another, why are you choosing to do, uh, the big fight right now is log White's Woods. It's a money thing. It's not for the betterment of the community. It actually is going to cost more money down the road because of repairs to roads and yeah. stormwater management and things like that. It's just if you ask these sorry, old white men, they choose not to answer and they think you're just being a pain. And I'm like, no, you need to answer the questions. Be honest with your public. Yeah. So, and so... I mean, I am now part of the Democratic Committee on the Democratic Committee to to help have better transparency um, in local government. That's um, that's great. I love that to help to help have transparency in local local government. Right. And when people are going to ask a question, they are given an honest answer. Yeah, I, I actually helped somebody last week who was moving her business from the borough into White Township, and she's been waiting for a permit approval and not getting anything. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, my business is also in my home and it's in White Township. Do what you need to do to get your business opened. And if there's something that comes back at it, I've read all the codes. I reread things and minutes all the time. So I said, there's nothing in the minutes or in the codes that say you cannot get your business open. When so, do people have to vote for you when you yes. when you're running? Yeah, and yep. when is the actual the election? In November. November, in November again. Yeah, the general elections in November. So I am finding out that there's elections every single year. It can be very, very exhausting. People just get tired of the whole election cycle because it's a lot of stuff. Well, let me know but, if there's anything we can do for you. Um, spread the word and post things yeah. somewhere, and maybe we can okay. do another. 
you know, half hour interview just on, you know, specifically. That. Sure, that would absolutely. be great sometime in September or October whenever it's helpful for you. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. But I really enjoyed meantime. our conversation, Judy. I oh. wish, you know, the hour went by so quickly. It and did. So much to talk really about. I feel, I feel like we just touched upon certain things and there's see, so I just need to come things. back and see you again. Exactly. And you yes. have to come visit us very soon. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to come in September because with the kids, it's a little bit difficult. And I know, I know. Going on, but I'll, I'll keep you posted. Right. Good talk. They are you. honoring Ken at the Folk Festival. Yeah. As the, as, as the entertainer in the area from regional entertainment. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's been the Northern Appalachian Folk Festival occurs the weekend after Labor Day. And every year they, they honor someone in education, in labor, in, in, in uh, the entertainment field, um, in multiple different sports, things like that, um, that have a, a local tie. And um, this year they're honoring Ken for the entertainment mm -hmm. side of things. So and that's yeah. in, it's in, not far from Indiana, right? No, just right in downtown. Just downtown. Okay. My mom will be here. My mom will be here will in September. She? Oh, so how wonderful. First, hopefully, you know, fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah, I know. Can. Please, you know, of course, send her love and we'll, we'll, we'll FaceTime. Yes, absolutely. That Judy, I love you. I'm so happy I you're my you, host mother. I'm so happy to be in touch with you. Good luck with everything. Um, and uh, we're going to be in touch. I appreciate that. And keep sending me those wonderful pictures of your babies. We'll do. Big okay, tell Marcella to hello too. <laughs> I will. <laughs> All right. All right. Take care, Bye, Judy. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Talk to you of soon. Of course. Bye. Of course.